Hello, my name is Ben. And I'm Cheyenne. And we are the hosts of the Too Big Podcast this week. Uh, let's start the episode like we normally do, although you don't you don't realize that this is normal, do you, Cheyenne? Uh, no, I'm a first time Too Vague uh, contestant right here. Cont- <laughs> contestant. What do I win you, for you, this? You just win an excellent conversation. That's what you win. I also did get to pet the cat, at least one of them. So Th- that's good. That's good. Yeah, and you and you caught a glimpse of the wild mango. Yes. Let's start out with a segment we call questions from my aunt. Ooh. Ooh. So if you are, you know, listening to the show and you have a question for us and you are my aunt, you can ask that question and we'll answer it. That's very specific. It It is, but I think she's the only one who's listening to the show. That, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> we all have our audience. Exactly. And my audience is Aunt Nora. She has a question about what is a respec? We talked about respecking last episode, and um, Cheyenne, you said you don't, you haven't heard of it referred to as that term. What do you, what do you refer to it when you have to reallocate your skill points and your attribute points in a in an RPG or another game? Generally, unless you're uh, letting the game auto level up the characters, I typically see it as basic skill assignment. Okay, especially. At the beginning of the game, right. um, although there are a lot of games that will give you the opportunity to go back and respec your character right. um, whenever you want. Right. And I think that's normal because sometimes you're playing something and you realize halfway through that you didn't assign your skill points very tactfully right. and things are just not working. Right. And that's that's the thing that we did. A, I did a pet peeve on a previous episode about... When it there's an in-game sort of cost for for reallocating your your attribute and skill points and stuff in a game, when making me create three different characters and play three different characters and then just restore someone and and reapply it, that's ridiculous. If it costs like you know millions of of currency in-game currency. You know why? Why even do that? Why put yeah. that there? So. It's a that's a huge drag. Yeah. Um, there are different versions of that I've played, and in Mass Effect, you can just go ahead and say unassign all skill points. Right. In uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, you can buy a special potion that clears all of your skills for you. It does cost about one hundred gold coins, which is their in-game currency, but that is pretty cheap yeah. for. Uh, for Dragon Age. Yeah. Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah, it was like millions of in in game credits. Why even why even do that? You're because just Because you have to do it right the first time. Well, you know, that's another thing with games too. There's something to be said for that, right? You're figuring out ways of of uh, accomplishing this task. You know what? We can we can get into that when we talk about choice because I think when you're trying to figure out the best way to handle a situation, that's kind of a choice. So but just to be concise with Aunt Nora, a respecification or a respec is the is the term that gamers use when they need to when they're going to reallocate some sort of you know points or levels or skills. So that's that's what that means. So so let's start into choice. Choice. S- yes, choice. When I say the word choice. What is, what is the first thought that comes into your head? Honestly, it makes me think of empowerment. Uh-huh. Being able to make choices, having the ability to make your own choices. But yeah. it does also make me think of computer programming. Okay. Because uh, I'm only what you would call a sophomore in college. Okay. But I've done a lot of research into logic and circuit diagrams, okay. for example. And you have your central processing unit, and it's basically choosing where it's going to allocate memory or energy into the computer based on a variety of different factors. Right. You know, maybe you're using a program that uses a lot of memory, so it's going to free up space for that. Right. So I think of choice in that manner as just 
having... When I think of that kind of choice, I think of algorithms. I think of mathematics. Right. Is that kind of what you're sort of getting at? It's a mathematical approach or or is it like, is it something else? Yeah, it, it basically is a mathematical choice. As, as far as what are you going to do with your computer degree? Have you thought about, um, I've thought about that or are you just going to kind of figure out as you go? Well, as you know, I'm a very... Uh, open, easy, breezy person. I got into software because, for one thing, it's something my father has always been very passionate about. He's he's a self-trained web developer of sort. Um, And I also view software as an incredibly useful skill and something that's going to be so needed in the future as things get more and more automated. Right, right. Um, So yeah, that was a choice that I made because I thought, hey, software programming is useful. Right. And ideally, my dream job, so to speak, is to become a robotic software engineer. Oh, so wow. I want to I wanna design the brain of the robot that helps you make your drink or drive your car or whatever. Interesting. You know? We're going to talk about um, Detroit Become Human at some oh, point. Yes. But choice in games, it's a hand-in-hand sort of thing, right? It's like... You know that it's it's a kind of obvious combo, right? Wouldn't right. you say it's it it's it's full of a number of choices as to how you handle situations. Yeah, especially in RPGs, which right. are my favorite type of game, right. obviously. But there are you know there are some games that don't have a very open storyline. Right. You drop into a map and you have a gun and you're just there to hurt people. Right. Um, right. But I love story-based games, and I love it when you're allowed to change the story yeah. based on what kind of character that you want to create. You know, right. it's about how the other characters in the game see you. And, you know, you're either this paragon of light and this hero, or you're the big bad villain who is so mean and will kick a puppy or something like yeah. that you know not that i would ever kick a puppy in real life but right i want to have the option in my digital <laughs> in e- my digital world <clears throat> not even for science for, you wanna, well you wanna kick a puppy no i love no. puppies too much i love puppies too you know what i used to work with someone who got really upset whenever i said um you know i was really frustrated and i'm gonna go outside and i would say i'm gonna go outside and punch a baby <laughs> They didn't like that at all. They don't want me using that. And I said, well, how about kicking a puppy? Is that okay? Also not okay. Also not okay. Right, right. Right. In real life and to say to this person. So <laughs> um, let's get back from because Because, I mean, I have something to add as far as BioWare's contribution to choice-based games. But let's uh, put on the brakes for a second. Right. Talking and, more about choice and yeah. what it means. So is that the only thing you, you think of how choice affects your day-to-day life with programming and then is there anything else i mean choice is a part of life right exactly and i kind of wanted to go into that too as much as thinking about choice as like a programming logical function is just a way to make it simpler to think about but we make so many choices every day it's really just our opportunity to react to any sort of external stimuli right so I go to work and I can choose, you know, if I'm going to wear this shirt or that shirt. Right. You know, it's all these simple little choices that don't seem to make up a lot of a difference. Right. But there are also points in life where you have to make more serious choices. And uh, I think I liked the word choice because it has affected me so much in who I've become today. That's exactly what choice is i mean it's it's life right right i also said uh, change is life but it's change and choice so <laughs> yeah we got both those things there i mean they are similar yeah making no, true making big choices can lead to changes so. exactly exactly one one thing leads to another yeah um which is a song from the 80s speaking <laughs> of the 80s we used to have a slang term where we used the word choice as in it's something very good. Very good, yeah. Um, and I did a little bit of research about uh, beef. 
beef. Yes, it's what's beef, for dinner. Meat. USDA grade A choice. I think we talked about this um, off the air, but that's a level of grading beef. So if you see at the store, you're you're a vegetarian or no? No, I I eat meat. Okay. So have you ever been to like the grocery store to buy meat and notice that there's various, you know, right the different grades? I can't say I've ever picked out the word choice on a oh, on okay. a package of ground beef, but okay. I am usually staring at the tiny little price tags underneath them, trying to haggle for the best unit price. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's the way to do it, right? I don't know if it applies to hamburgers, but I know that it definitely applies to steak. Um, and Because hamburger can be mixed, right? It can be beef and something else. Can oh, it? yeah. When something is graded as prime, there is a moderate sort of marbling are you familiar with the concept of marbling yes yeah um i'm pretty sure nora is also familiar with the concept of marbling i i don't want it to sound like i'm talking down to you like <laughs> like you know that's a, it's a it's that's an a actual, question it's, for next week what is marbling right right it's just it's, basically fat inside of the meat right that when right, you cook it it right. becomes really tender exactly. and juicy exactly so that's that's exactly what marbling is and prime is young well-fed cattle so choice is a middle sort of grade that's high quality but there's less marbling and then there is select so if you want something that's not prime not not you know like middle so so something that's one step less than prime then choice is your is yeah. your grade according to the USDA it's not prime but it is choice it is choice <laughs> <laughs> that's my advertisement there excellent that was very that was very good you do voiceovers me oh i could probably i think you know what don't you think it's like everyone's dream to do a voiceover someday well it's the most fun job you could possibly have you get to sit in a chair and make funny voices all day it's a dream so no yeah. i mean just sitting in a chair making funny voices all day i can do that in my own free time <laughs> but you don't get paid for it well, necessarily that's true. that's true not to get off on the food branch of what choice means are you familiar with the Instant coffee. Right. Yeah. Right. Like Folgers or whatever. Right. Not that this is sponsored by Folgers. No, but... it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to mention Taster's Choice, which was a common brand of instant coffee. I did a lot of research for this episode. I hope you I hope you appreciate that. I did zero research. Well, that's so fine. So that's fine. I think you it complements each other well. You don't you don't have to. There are going to be questions about, you know, things along the way, like what is marbling? <laughs> Which you already know. Maybe I shouldn't say companies on this on the air. But you know what? I don't think it's going to impact Nora's buying patterns too much. So um, <laughs> Nest, Nest, the first instant coffee was created in, by the Brits in 1771 for military uh, use. And it was called, <laughs> get this. This is very I, I don't know I'm not to not to stereotype or anything. Can you can you give it a guess what uh, what do you think uh, it was called? I don't know if I want to. Okay. Now. All right. It was coffee compound. Coffee. Oh, it almost sounds like military rations. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that makes sense, right? If it was a military sort of um, invention, and then let's flash forward to World War One which is uh, a time when instant coffee was getting pretty popular amongst military. It's, it's, it's very easy to transport, very easy to use, quick, all these things that you need in a military situation. In 1930, Brazil had a surplus of coffee. If they didn't do something with it, it was going to go bad. So what they ended up doing was this Brazilian coffee board at the time reached out to the CEO of Nestle Corporation and said, is there anything that you can do with these with these beans? And so basically they engaged in some serious research on making the best tasting and the coffee using chemicals, but also just using straight up coffee and nothing else. 
pretty interesting where it comes from. So military, a lot of a lot of uh, advances. A long history of choice coffee products. Correct. <laughs> you have your choice. You either have. Oh, you know what? I should do some rapid fire choice questions. Decaf oh. or, or caffeinated? Caffeinated. Okay. Um, super salad. Salad. Chicken or beef? Beef. Plastic or paper? Paper. All right. Wow. Absolutely. This is great. So I'm going to throw some more of those at you. In the, oh, that's <laughs> as totally we go on fine. In the episode. I love it. It makes me feel like I'm on a game show. You know, and and, and that's what you said earlier, correct? Right. <laughs> right. You know, what, you, am, you what are, am I winning? You're our contestant. contestant. Yes. Do you want to add something about choice in your life or choice. a story about choices? Or I, I would like to share a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, expanding on what I said earlier about how choice is such a large part of my life. I feel like I'm being a little vague with that because uh, choice is obviously a part of everyone's life. Right. And you're on the right show. Yeah. Too vague. I'm being too vague about it. Right. Um, I was raised in a very sort of insular religious community. And I think for some people, they don't necessarily feel like they have a lot of choice in life. And that is something that I experienced a lot, especially when I was becoming a teenager. Mm -hmm. For example, in this community, there were certain life choices that you were really strongly advised against making, you know, such as going to college or dating somebody who wasn't a part of that community. And I went with it for most of my life without a problem. I just thought, you know, this is the best way that I can be. That's what everyone's telling me. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I was in 10th grade, I took a biology course for the first time. And it taught me about evolution of all things, like um, biological evolution. Right. And... I just remember being so amazed by some of the things that I was learning. At first, I was really scared. I was like, hey, this goes against everything I've been taught. Right. And then... Was this in the public school system then? It was. It it actually was. I went to a really small high school in Tenasket, Washington, Okay. which I'm sure nobody knows where that is, but it's maybe 20 minutes south of the Canadian border. Okay. I, I think there's a one of those little nursery rooms about Tenisket, Tenasket, oh. a little yellow basket, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I definitely never heard that. No, but... it's, I'm just kidding. It doesn't <laughs> exist. So continue. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, but yeah, surprisingly, I got a really good education right. uh, in science at this class. So did your family n- realize that this was kind of starting the wheels turning about, you know, going against what you had been brought up with? At first, no, because I remember coming home on the first day of that class and I told my mom, I was so upset. I said, mom, this class, they told us we're not going to be learning about creationism because it's too, they said there's no scientific basis for it. And because of our curriculum, we're only going to be studying evolution. And she told me to challenge myself and use it as an opportunity to preach and to have a good example of my faith for my classmates. Okay. So I went in there and I was all ready to just disprove all this evolution stuff because I had done so much biblical research. Right. And then a month later, I it sort of clicked and I was like, whoa, this this makes sense. There's a lot of fields of science that support this. Right, um, right. One of the things that really caught my brain, I'll say, was the, the study of embryology, which is just comparing like the embryos of different organic species uh-huh. um, and also being able to track the similarities between DNA of different species. Right. I was so surprised that you could even do that. So the long story short is that this biology class made me realize that I was an atheist because I soon started thinking, you know, and this is only for me personally. I know a lot of people who believe in God and I totally respect that. Right. But for me, it was a way to open a road, you know, a new Mm -hmm. choice. If, If life can evolve, if it doesn't necessarily need to be created, then, you know, do I necessarily have to live this way? Right. Right. It started to open up possibilities. Right. Interesting. So with the religious community, 
we we don't have to talk too much about that if you don't want to. But oh, I'm totally um, open to talking about it. I don't know how much you're comfortable talking about it, but well, yeah. um, it's it's entirely up to you. That's a pretty unique story, and you have a, a perspective on that sort of thing. I was born um, in a household. My mother was kind of, you know, passively religious, right? And my father was an atheist. So I got sort of a different, you know, upbringing, and we didn't really go to church, and we really didn't learn a lot about biblical stuff, which I think I think we kind of missed. You know what I mean? There's There's a lot of history there, too, and a lot of interesting things. I don't know if the difference between Bibles says anything, but it's, you know, there, there, there are, there are lessons to be learned from that, I think. Sure. Sure. Um, but as far as the religion versus science, I'm going to pick science every time. Yeah. You know, and I don't think it necessarily has to be a dualist type thing or a, or a religion versus science. I think that many religions can embrace science. Right. Um, just as they embrace parts of their religion that are a part of their culture or, you know, their shared knowledge. And I think that's awesome. But yeah. with this particular community, it was detrimental, the extent to which they were trying to protect the people in their community from learning things like evolution. Right. You know, they right. basically would compare it to something that was inspired by the devil. And as I got older, I just realized how ludicrous that is, you know. Fat Boy Slim. Are you familiar with Fat Boy Slim? No. That seems like a good enough... Uh, I, I can't... I, I didn't know how to connect Fat Boy Slim to uh, to, to religion. religion. Yeah. But um, Fat Boy Slim is a... I guess the best way to describe him is sort of a DJ, electronic kind of musician, a lot of mixing, a lot of samples. His actual name is Norman Quinton Cook. Um, but he's known as Fat Boy Slim, and he has a video called "Weapon of Choice," which is the whole video. It was directed by Spike Jones. Are you familiar with Spike Jones? No. A director, movie maker, Christopher Walken dancing in a hotel. That sounds wildly entertaining. It 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 is, and it's it won several awards. Weapon of Choice. Christopher Walken approached Spike Jones and said. Can you record me doing some of my dancing? Before he got involved in theater, he was a dancer and he did a lot of tap dancing and stuff. So. Oh, okay. So I like to think he was really enthusiastic about being a part of that project. Oh, totally. Just I'm, as a way to showcase his dance moves. Exactly. Well, there's that. And then also it's something different for him, right? It's something to challenge him too. So Spike Jones, when this opportunity to make this video came up, you know, said, "Hey, would you would you want to be in this video?" So, and he said, "Definitely." So it was really um, there's a lot of mutual respect between Christopher Walken and Spike Jones as far as creativity and stuff. And I'm definitely going to show you the video during during our our break Got because it. it is very. You might not like the the music, but it is pretty fun to watch. I probably will like the dancing. Okay. Consumer reports. <laughs> do you do you get the impression that I'm just saying random shit? Sometimes. Okay. It's like, so how about that weather? How, how about that weather? How about those consumer reports? Consumer reports was um was a magazine that was out and I'm sure they now have a web presence. And they had a a children's version that I had gotten for a little while, but I preferred the adult version. It's basically, it compares like best fast food burger. <laughs> it's oh. it's basically, it's yeah, it's basically like a thing where it's a ranking system. Right. So it helps you make the right choice. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And that was, um, you know, like that was well before. I mean, you had reviews on things, but you didn't have a, a group. That was their job was to rank things. And it wasn't just food. It was... You know, best can opener. Best or lawnmower. Best lawnmower. And uh, Consumer Reports. I don't have much history on Consumer Reports. It's just that when I think of choice, yeah. that's what I think of in my life was the fact that I had 
um, a subscription to that and I was fascinated by they had like a grid like thing where it was like you know it showed you where the boxes were ticked for each thing it was very 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 scientific looking well it's interesting how you know because we have such a plethora of options you know we live in this wonderful capitalist uh <laughs> climate but you go to the grocery store and if you just want to buy like a toilet scrubber brush, there's probably like four different brands right. of toilet scrubber brushes. Right. Um, and I want to say for the record that that is not the last thing that I bought at the grocery store. Okay. But, <laughs> but um, it's just what interesting. Was, what, was the, what was the last thing you bought at the grocery store? Oh, gosh. I want to say it was probably whiskey because that's usually what I buy at the that's, store. That's a good purchase. But I also bought a weird assortment of things at Walmart the other day with my boyfriend, and we were talking about the weirdness of it. It was like hair conditioner, salad dressing, um, boot laces, and beer and that was like what we went to check out with and i was like there's no algorithm in the world that could make sense of this <laughs> uh, yeah another thing th that i think about people at at grocery stores and stores like target and whatnot do they have a piece of them that's trying to figure out the purchases like the grouping like oh right. that's an interesting grouping you know yeah like baby socks and a blowtorch or right something, right <laughs> exactly but, I mean, if you make an online purchase, that's happening constantly. Right. You know, it's your, happening in the background. Your data is being uh, processed and used to figure out, oh, what kind of person are you? If you look on the history of your Google data, which some people have turned off, um, it'll, it has very scary and accurate predictions about your age, where you live, you know, your gender identity, right. all sorts of things like that you wouldn't even think your consumer purchases made a difference right you know interesting that's one thing that the grocery store doesn't do no they don't they don't scan but, you but and... the the banks probably i mean you, you know what i mean there's banking records i mean oh, i don't yeah. know if banks would supply that to to the corporations so they can kind of i think if they could they would yeah no. but that's uh right. maybe that's just the cynic in me so perhaps Black Mirror, if you ever oh my gosh, Black Mirror. I love Black Mirror. What is the uh, what is the thing you like about Black Mirror? Is it the stories? Is it a lot of shows? You know, I have a hard time getting into them. You get like really long TV dramas, and uh, it's easy to get hooked on them. But it's also hard for some people like me who have a short attention span. And what I like about Black Mirror is that every episode is its own thing, right? And they're loosely connected through this world. They even put Easter eggs in their episodes. I don't know if you've noticed any of those, but sometimes there will be a fun little Easter egg in an episode that refers to, to something one. from another yeah. episode. Yeah. So every episode is its own creation, and it covers a different element of like the spooky, futuristic dystopia. You know, whether that's a a robotic warehouse dog that's just protecting. Um, goods that aren't even being used and right. ends up, you know, going on a rabid chase after scavengers. Um, right. Or there's that, there's the episode where every person who lives in this apartment complex has to go and sit on a, on a bicycle, basically like a standing bike every day and generate power. And their only escape from this is these tiny screens that they watch where people can compete to be a part of this, essentially reality tv show where you're showcasing your talents huh um so it's just unique and it's so immersive right, right. Uh, and that's what i love about it okay did you ever play the bandersnatch did oh, you ever yes. play that one i played bandersnatch so much that i probably broke the game <laughs> So you, you basically went through it and tried to get every single combination of, of things Absolutely. as far as your choices? Absolutely. I'm obsessed with that, with choice-based games. I think uh. that's part of the fun is discovering and rediscovering how many different narratives that you can create. And Bandersnatch is amazing and spooky, and it has a meta fourth wall dimension to it that is really enjoyable. Huh. Yeah, that, that reminds me of another choice-based sort of thing that's similar to, to Bandersnatch, which is the Choose Your Own Adventure book. Right. Are you familiar with the Choose Your Own Adventure books? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah I have... Flip to page 74 if right. you want to do this. Right. If you want to 
lick this thing. <laughs> lick whatever. the toad. Lick the toad. Is that what Bandersnatch is? Is basically a choose your own adventure book? I think it is supposed to start especially as a choose your own adventure book you know and the first choices you're presented with are very small you know do you want to have frosties or kellogg's for breakfast and what kind of music do you want to listen to on your bus ride to work and then the choices get a little more serious and then uh the fun part i don't want to spoil anything so stop me if you don't want to hear this. Oh no, no, that's fine. Uh, we can do a, we can do a spoiler alert. Right. Well, okay. Official spoiler alert. Eventually, uh, the more choices you make, the main character, the protagonist of this choose your own adventure tale, becomes aware that someone is controlling his actions, oh, okay. and he starts to fight back. And he oh. also gets a little mentally shaky as he grapples with someone controlling his reality. Right. You can send him messages from the future and tell him that you're watching him on Netflix. And right. he will say, what is a Netflix? Which I think is hilarious. Right. Is everyone going to get that? Is it something where if you make a wrong choice, you die and you don't get to that point? Is it a hierarchical um, sort of scenario where you go down a path and then you have to go back and start that path again and choose different things? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there is basically a linear storyline that you follow right um there are several routes that you can take to get there if you die early for example you can go back to the last big choice you made and then just go from there okay um so it gives you that option yeah but maybe somebody playing bandersnatch just decided you know what i i died this is it the game over and they you know just never went back and played it again which is totally valid I talked to someone I, I worked with about this, about Bandersnatch, and what he didn't like was the mundane choices. So at the beginning, with the whole mundane things like the the serials, he didn't see a purpose for it and didn't see, like, well, why why are you having me do this? And you don't, and it seems like you don't get that idea until you finish the game, right? Yeah, I would disagree with that only because I think choosing between you know frosties or kellogg's or whatever those cereals were called i think it does have an impact later in the game right um but what i'm saying is he he didn't see it right oh, right. he didn't he didn't see that he was like well this is stupid because I'm, I'm not making an informed decision i'm making a decision based randomly right well to that i would say maybe that was more of a tutorial for people who were you know, not familiar with or maybe slower to pick up on the platform. Right, right. Um, so it was a way to give a couple quick, easy choices so people can say, oh, okay, you know, right. he's going to do whatever I say. Right, right. Um, but when you're picking music, for example, in the, on the bus ride to work, later on a character will ask you, well, what do you listen to to get into the zone? And then, boom, you're talking about the song you listened to earlier. Okay. So. Hmm. I just think little things like that are cool and they add some depth and dimension to the story. Even if it is linear or appears to be linear, it's something where it carries your choices actually carry a little bit of weight, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which is uh, a tricky, uh, I would say it's a tricky thing to do well in, in games, but big thumbs up on the Black Mirror. Oh, absolutely. Which I... You always for some reason want to call it dark mirror and people always <laughs> no go, that's, that's not it um there's also a great mini series called love death and robots which oh, is okay. also on, and i think it's supposed to be like black mirror's cousin or something okay because they're also short um usually animated episodes that are each their own story uh-huh. and they get a little bit weirder right. um Black Mirror is pretty weird, so I'm surprised to even say that. But they they are they're bizarre, and they usually take place in a huge variety of like sci-fi landscapes. Mm-hmm. You know, either deserts or uh, you know, I'm trying to remember now. You know, lots of cyberpunk city type things. Okay, so it's really cool. Yeah, are you a big fan of science fiction in general? Yeah, I am a pretty big sci-fi geek. Yeah. Um, I say that having only like loose knowledge of Battlestar Galactica and uh, Star Trek. So yeah. don't come for me. And a lot of my love of sci-fi actually came from Mass Effect. You know, the oh, my, yeah. my original 
choice-based game. Although, I, to be fair, Knights of the Old Republic was another early choice-based game that right. I totally fell in love with. Right. So, I, I, for some reason, sci-fi narratives and, and choice-based narratives are kind of one and the same for me. Right. One thing that I wanted to touch on first before we get like full bore into our... What what it is shaping up to be a big discussion about Bioware? All right. Well, <laughs> right? There, there's more than just well, Bioware, no, no. I, but, yeah, uh, understood. Understood. And we we we're going to talk about a few of them. But with Mass Effect, I mean it it has a great cast of characters. It has great character development, and you are involved in that pretty much every step of the way through all three games. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was, I think, at the time when these were originally released, specifically three, where people were disappointed in the ending because there were certain things that would impact, you know, the path you got to wherever. But it didn't, your choices didn't impact the ending. They didn't feel like they had weight, according to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I think for that, it's sort of, the journey is different based on your choices, and it doesn't have to be uh, one of those games where you have you know eighty different endings or whatever based on your choices. It doesn't right. have to be that way. It can still end up the same way. It's just the journey you took to get there was different, right? Based on your choices, absolutely. And that's that. I think is kind of lost on some people. People associate choice based games with having multiple endings based on your choices, which I guess is kind of cool but for me i like the story i want to be told a story and i want a good concise ending do you have any strong thoughts on the ending of uh of mass effect 3 i guess i wasn't dis- disappointed necessarily okay. i do i think that the changes of the ending were enough that i felt that everything was wrapped up very nicely okay. like you said it was Concise. I never, yeah, I never, I never played the other things. Oh, uh, you mean Mass Effect Andromeda? Maybe? No, or... no, I'm talking about Mass Effect Three. The ending had choices where you could basically say either keep the bio, keep the synthetic, or merge them into into one. Right. The synthesis option. The synthesis option, and that's the one I thought was like really freaking cool. It's like, oh wow, if I do that, well then. That's going to change a whole bunch of stuff in the in the story going forward, right? But people complained about it so much that it was like you had EA scrambling to, I guess, make it right or do what they said. If I was, you know, listen, if I write a story, yeah, I don't know, EA is paying my paycheck, so I probably wouldn't do this. But, but I mean, it's like. Yeah, that's how the story ends. Deal with it. Right, exactly. You know? It's, you know, when you, it's a lot of responsibility as a writer to come up with these endings and to, and to satisfy everyone. And frankly, if you have such a large audience, there's always going to be people who are, who are upset. And correct. I am, I'm a total Mass Effect fan, but that, you know, that doesn't mean I don't have criticisms of the ending. Uh-huh. I'm sure that there are ways they could have made it a little more unique, depending or on the choice you made yeah. or compelling. But at the same time, Mass Effect 3 is a very complex game with a lot of moving parts. And I think that they synthesized all that together in a way that was very satisfying. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I enjoyed all three of them. They just released the remaster of all of them. I know. I'm playing it right now. Oh, okay. (laughs) So have there been any changes that you can detect as far as I hear that they needed to do something crazy with the code base of the first one because it wasn't designed to be. Yes. Yeah. Originally, it was very, it was just retro. You know, it's very blocky. The combat is kind of difficult. And they just remastered it to make it more visually appealing. Although some of the, some of the remastering didn't turn out so well. There are certain characters that look kind of like lizard-like and not on purpose. (laughs) Um So that was disappointing. But in general, the remaster has been really enjoyable to play. It's smoother. Um, 
they didn't necessarily revamp all the combat, but it's easier. Um, I like it. I think they did a really good job. Cool. I'm not going to play it. Why? You know what? It's 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 something where I played it once and it, and once is enough. So for you, you can play a choice based narrative and and then just decide that the choices you made the first time were were just good enough. You're like, well, it depends. You know, another choice based game we we're going to talk about is Detroit Become Human. Oh yeah. Um, and, and that's and that that's how I played that game because just the story itself didn't. I didn't want to see all the endings. Although I thought it was really cool that that it told you in map form your different options that you may have missed along the way. I thought right. that was really cool. And it's like if I wanted to perfect that one, I could. It just it wasn't as enjoyable to me as a game. Right. That's so, fair. That's totally fair. Yeah. I do like how in the timeline that you're referring to for Detroit Become Human, you can even find exactly where in the in the episode or the scene that branch happens you know right. sometimes you'll be able to see oh the offshoot happens here before i talk to this character so right you know before i talk to this character or go through this door i need to look around and make sure i'm not missing something right right and as somebody who loves to unlock every possibility you know every possible ending i i loved that i was like thank you this is mm. so easy i mean not necessarily easy because sometimes those things don't jump out at you right but right. it still makes it easier to track you know where in the scene you can kind of explore and do something a little bit differently right for me as far as choice based games i mean it really depends on the game it depends on whether or not i want to i mean i enjoyed the game mechanics so much that i need to play through the story again or i have different options to go through and and unlock different endings that are unique but I think one of the problems with something like like Detroit Become Human, if you have, I mean, I don't know how many total endings there were. Do you know? I don't know. Okay. I think it's somewhere in the realm of like six. Okay, so it's not like, well, if you count every way you can die and all that stuff, that doesn't count. But we're talking about like right. final, all of your characters, all three of them survive mm -hmm. kind of thing right? to some extent. I don't know. It really varies. The, the story itself wasn't compelling enough. I didn't get as much of enjoyment out of the whole story that I felt like I had to go back and replay it. Yeah. You know, one game we haven't talked about that I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't mention is the the Life is Strange. Oh, yeah, definitely. The, definitely. There's two Life is Strange games. Um, right. I guess there's technically three because there's one called Before the Storm, which is like a right. kind of like a spinoff game. And I think that is almost similar to Detroit Become Human because you have like these very immersive scenes that you're walking through as a character. Right. And at the end of each scene, you go through and say and see the the timeline of choices that you make. Right. And these are very, I think they're very um, dark, but but also endearing games mm -hmm. that uh, especially appeal to young adults yeah on kenny's episode we talked about tell me why so the game tell me why by don't not entertainment um which came out on the xbox and windows it's a story of twins that reunite in alaska after the death of their mother and it's a a trans man character and his sister they're twins. Right. So they have twin-like powers that they can utilize in this game. But I think that's also another one of those story choice-based games that are that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've played several games um, that were made or produced by Don't Not. I think that's, that sounds really good. I never even knew that existed. So. Yeah, yeah, check it out. You also mentioned KOTOR. Oh, yes. The morality system from KOTOR was used in a game that was... The original big honking huge Xbox, the very first one. Have you seen pictures of it? Uh, it looks no, like a, I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, it looks like a friggin' brick with a big X on it. It's huge. Um, but anyway, it Bioware made a Xbox exclusive game 
called Jada Empire. And mm. it was later released on PCs and, and you know other platforms. But that is one of the – the thing I like about that and the choice in Jade Empire was they had the morality system, but it wasn't a good or evil kind of thing. What the morality system did do was it would change your options as far as speaking with people and communicating people and getting into relationships with people. Right. But it wasn't a good versus bad. It was basically – um, the two moralities, quote unquote, were open palm, clenched fist. So right. it was it was kind of cool in that way, where it's you're you're not you're not doing a paragon. Um, what was it? What's the other versus one? renegade? Renegade, yeah, kind of thing where it's like good and evil. Yeah, you know. I think a lot of those like duality type choice morality things they're often similar there's always an option where you can be extremely empathetic and helpful to people right and on the other hand you can also be very closed off aggressive and use your station you know of power right um right. so i don't necessarily think it's always supposed to be good versus evil it's about the way you approach other characters you know are you empathetic or are you more manipulative right I think with the clenched fist, open palm thing, it impacts the powers. Um, right. It's a really cool. It's a really cool game that you should check out if you have a second to. It was made right after Kotor. There were options for, you know, for relationships in that. I don't remember if there were there were in Kotor. I don't think there were. No, you can romance characters okay. in Kotor. Okay. I have always been a huge fan of romancing in choice based games. I consider myself a collector of bioware romances oh so Ooh. yeah i like to see what every character's romance is like okay not in a creepy kind of like what does the sex scene look like kind no of way. not a, not like that necessarily i mean but you can't lie everyone everyone's doing it for that reason right. um but well, at the very least the 11 year old boys are exactly but it's more about getting to see that secret side of these characters right that they don't show to everybody else you right. know right when they're when they fall in love with you um in particular with dragon age um which is another one of my favorite bioware choice based games there's just so many options in every game you know right the neat thing about dragon age 2 with romancing is that you can what they call friend mans or rival mans characters so you can up your you know your prestige with these characters and be their best friend and romance them or you can make them hate you Okay. And then and then you guys just are so in love with each other that it doesn't matter. Like uh, you know, like enemies to lovers type thing. Huh. Which I think is so different and unique. Yeah. So you never know what you're gonna find out if you if you're collecting romances <laughs> like I like to do. Yeah. Like I remember playing those games for the first time. It was sort of like you know, maybe it was like, okay, what is this scene going to look like? Maybe maybe there was some part of me that was like that. And I wasn't really focusing on how the relationship impacts the story down the road. Doesn't the information for Mass Effect carry over from story to story as far as romance stuff is oh, concerned? Oh, yeah. And it's very dramatic. Yeah. If you romance a character in Mass Effect 1, there's really no way to romance the same character in the second game but right. you can romance them again in the third game and if you decided to step out on them in mass effect 2 like they will remember and yeah. they'll be like hey i heard you had a relationship with this character and i'm not okay with it ashley yeah yeah or or Caden, or i guess those are really the only two that carry over through all three games. You can also romance Liara, who is a personal favorite of mine. Right. Because she's just a sweetheart. Right. Um, and then also you do things with the, the Justicar or whatever, whatever her name is. Um, the Asari Justicar. Samara? Yeah. Samara. And then her daughter. I remember. Oh, yeah. I do. I remember that. That's Mass yeah. Effect 2. Right. And at one point, it's almost like a, a heist or a plot that you're trying to do where you go and pick up Samara's daughter in a bar 
and you're but you're really just using it as an excuse to get close to her so right. that you know you can take her out because she's dangerous right but then it, as it turns out you can also you can also basically be a part of her side too yeah i remember i did evil. that too yeah. yeah when i played it originally there i was you know trying to unlock different stuff but i remember that was kind of a, a cool sort of thing and it's like it does carry over to to three where the character is samara but isn't samara <laughs> yeah so, no yeah. that's weird i agree it's it's kind of strange the way they added that in they're like well if you made this choice then we've got to make this work somehow so right she's disguising herself right. as her mother right because that's a good tactic yeah it works <laughs> yeah until she goes nuts and starts whatever. <laughs> but like, that's not your problem. You're no, Commander Shepard, savior of the universe. You can hardly be bothered with these <laughs> trifles. <laughs> with these silly choices. Anyway, to go super retro really quick, there were a lot of hierarchical sort of choices that were made. Maybe I just decided like saying the word hierarchical. <laughs> it's a tough think that word. Is? It's, a, it's a fun word to say. It just means branching. <laughs> yeah. A branching sort of structure. Um, but anyway, the um, there were some arcade games that had things where you had choices, even though it was like quarter operated kind of thing, where um, there were racing games where you could choose the easy route or the hard route and right. it would get you to different endings depending on which route you took. There was also a game that I really like called uh, Night Striker that was... Um, kind of one where the cool thing about it was the ending that you got to your character turned into a different kind of vehicle that you would use for that final level. It was a more of a contained choice. Right. But still, Definitely still very a choice, still creating a difference. Yeah. There's also choices in maps, right? As far as which paths you want to follow to get to a place. Yeah. There's almost... I mean, games themselves are almost just choices. <laughs> it's like but how yeah. you want to tackle whatever this thing is, is a choice. It's also a strategy, but you have a lot of choices in that strategy as far as how you're going to accomplish said task, right? Um, but I was going to mention Galaga. Do you remember Galaga? Very vaguely. It was just That's pretty old. Yeah, it was 1981. The big choice in that game was... You had one ship that would come down and it would do a beam that would abduct your ship. And it would take take your ship back up to up and you would have the ship on top of the other ship, right? Mm -hmm. And it would come down during the regular level and you could accidentally shoot that ship and you lost a life. Or if you shoot the ship that... that abducted your ship it would spin around and it would come down and you have a double ship that shot double so that was an interesting choice based video game that i remember <laughs> was yeah. like you know do you want to do you want to do it do it uh, just one bullet or do you want to try and risk it i think that's almost like upgrading in yeah. a way just uh, a neat little mechanic that you can use to create a super awesome uh, ship with two lasers right. instead of one. Character selection. But when you're playing games where you're not playing as a unique sort of character, like your shepherd or whatever. Where it's right. Like, although there are some customizable options for your shepherd to make you look, I guess, Different. unique. Yeah. yeah. But is that a choice that you want? In your game, I mean, some I can understand catering to people that want to customize your character because you show it in a multiplayer kind of scenario, right? But how does it impact the story, and does it? Right? I think it really does make a difference. Um, does it make a difference to your gameplay? Does it make a difference to it your makes personal enjoyment, or is it? I believe it's more about the the personal enjoyment and okay. really creating the narrative because right. part of what makes Commander Shepard so great is that they can be anyone, you know? Right. And not only... Uh, unfortunately, Mass Effect has a very binary choice between being male and female and they don't represent non-binary or transgender people. Right. But you can choose the color of your skin. You can choose 
the color of your hair or the length of your hair. And I love that people who would want to look more feminine as Shepard can look feminine or they can have a shaved head. You know, you can customize your armor. Yeah. Um, you can, in some cases, customize how your body looks, you know, right. and the and the scars you have. And maybe that sort of option doesn't make a huge difference on the gameplay itself, but it lets the person playing feel like they are inside the game. Yeah. Because their their vision is the one who's walking Appearing around, defeating the, the Geth, you know. They right. feel like they are Shepard. And I think that's a big part of those narrative-based games. Huh. You know, I didn't think of it that way is the fact that it's it's a way to immerse you. But my thought on it was, have you played games where you're creating these characters, right? You're creating how they looked, and it just feels like it's secondary to the story. It doesn't, it feels just like, oh, well, other things have these character creators and, and things that, you know, what what is the purpose? But I think there should be something where the way you customize your character can impact the story. Um, I think Chris and I were talking about this where it was when they make the 007 game, IO Interactive, uh, what a cool thing would be depending, like it, it create your own bond. So you can be your own James Bond. So you can kind of immerse yourself in, in the story and be your own spy. Doesn't matter what gender doesn't matter whatever just be that character but one of the things that he brought up was it would be cool is the the difficulty of the level may change depending on what ethnicity or skin color or things that you chose or things like that would be easier to blend in in certain circumstances and not in others that is a really tricky tightrope to walk. Exactly. Um, but, I mean, I think that would add an extra level of immersion in the game that if you if you appear a certain way, your experience will be different. You know what I mean? Do you think right. That, do you think that's something that, are, are we overthinking it here? Or are we... Not necessarily. I think that's a really intriguing concept. Yeah. I... I agree with you that it's such a hard line to walk because at a certain point you always have to step back and think about what you're really saying with the mechanics of your gameplay. And you always have to make sure that you use the utmost empathy and sensitivity when building games and mechanics like that where, you know, you just don't want to say the wrong thing or, or detract even from... The real message of your game, right. which is that you are your own James Bond, you are your own version of James Bond, you know, and right. that shouldn't matter, matter yeah. what what gender or ethnicity you are. Exactly, exactly. So there's yeah, there's there's a tricky thing there. It's and it's hard to send messages about you know how the experiences that different people of different races have, especially when you only have the experience that you were born and have lived with your entire life. Can can you put too many choices in a game, do you think? Do you, oh, do you sure. think that, Okay. Do you have any examples or do you just think that it would be too confusing? I guess I don't have examples of a game that I've played that I thought, wow, this has too many choices. I will say <laughs> when I was playing The Outer Worlds, for example, the first time. Did I was, you like that? No, I did not. Okay. Um but the one of the things that I noticed about it is their loot system and their consumables system was just so complicated. There are probably 60 different unique consumable items that yeah. you can pick up and I did not have the time or the interest in figuring out how they buffed my character, especially because all of the buffs were so just they didn't even matter. Yeah. You know, it gives you 20 stamina. It's like when you pick up a gun in Fallout. And it's like, well, you have a 5% chance to hurt a human if you're wielding an axe in your left arm. It's like, why would I ever need that? You know, what's the point of that? Right, right. There's there's some overthinking that could be done with choices. Right. Cyberpunk 2077 had, um, you know, it seemed like they did this as more of a, a way to be funny. 
but they had like you know it must have been a hundred different food kind of things you could you could buy yeah. but they all did pretty much the same thing exactly and that's and the like, kind well, of choice where it doesn't it doesn't really matter because it's food is food and it's always going to give you 50 x you know 50 hp or well, whatever well the problem with that is they they all took up their own slot because they were unique <laughs> looking things yeah i didn't use any of those food items i just sold them but it's just kind of like well what's the purpose right i mean giving me this choice doesn't make any difference whatsoever so why put the choice in there yeah and to kind of take it back to my mother's child raising advice oh okay right which is when you're raising children what you want to do is you want to give them choices but you don't want to give them too many options so essentially you say two or three things do you want to do this this or this that way they feel empowered to make a choice on what they want and as they get more comfortable with making those choices they get more and more options right and until they get to a point where they're not overwhelmed by going into the candy store and seeing everything available for them. Right. Right? Absolutely. There's, there's a certain level of frustration and excitement that go along with that. Too many choices is also a bad thing as far as a game is concerned. It's like striking a good balance. Oh, yeah. You That's know? the key, right? And I, I agree with that. I, As you know, I'm a supervisor at uh, the coffee shop where I work. Right. And it's funny, your 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 mother's advice made me think about the way that I try to interact with the employees that I work with. Uh-huh. And it's my job to tell them where they're going to be working right. for the day or for the next two hours. Right. And I just know how important it is to feel like you have some agency, right. especially in a job that can be extremely stressful and difficult. Yeah, and, and thankless. So, it's, a, it's a thankless job. It is. And especially as we get closer into the holiday season, oh, it's, gosh. it's becoming more and more stressful. Yeah. Pump, and Pumpkin spice can die in a flaming garbage truck fire uh, going off a cliff. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Uh, it's just the worst. But I think it's... One thing that I like to do for the people I work with is to give them options. Is right. to say, hey, like... How are you feeling today, first of all? And second of all, would you rather go and make drinks? Or would you rather help people at the window? Would you rather work on cleaning tasks? And even though they're all generally going to be doing the same things every day, like you said, there's only so many options. But they have a choice. You know, if someone's feeling lethargic and they don't want to have to move, you know, their body for two hours straight, they don't have to go and make drinks. They can go and stand at the window and help people, and it's a little bit slower paced. Right. I want it to be more of a democratic process. I want to give them more choice in the matter. Right, exactly. Because it makes a huge difference on your morale. Yeah, attitude, totally. It definitely does. Definitely does. I never did that when I was a shift supervisor. I just told people I didn't like to go clean the bathrooms. Karma's a bitch. Karma is a bitch. And on that note, let's end the show. All right. (laughs) My name is still Ben. And my name is still Cheyenne. And we have been your hosts. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day.